Welcome to the BCM podcast. We're going to jump right in because we have a really special guest today. Joining the show is today with us is retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. Colonel McGregor is the CEO of Our Country, Our Choice. He's a dedicated combat veteran, former senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense, the author of five books, and an expert in foreign policy. Okay, well, let's Colonel stop McGregor. there. Don't waste any more time. Let's get to it. <laughs> so I agree. I agree. So we want to talk about a bunch of things today, but let's start with Ukraine. And the first question, I, I want to kind of like level set uh, here. There's a lot of people out there who are still saying, you know, Ukraine can win the war, whatever that means. Can you start by just giving your uh, giving us your assessment of that idea? Uh, the Ukrainian nation is largely destroyed. Uh, it's down to somewhere in the neighborhood of between 18 and 21 million people left in the country. In other words, half the population has abandoned the place. Uh, you've had at least 500 to 520,000 killed in the war, Ukrainian soldiers. On top of that, you probably have another half million to a million casualties. Many of these people were so severely wounded, they'll never return to active duty. The force in the field has a, a basically abandoned most of its positions. The Russians are advancing slowly, deliberately, but in most cases against little or no opposition. The government in Kiev, which is one of the most corrupt, incompetent, and destructive entities on the planet, is falling apart to the point where the various co-conspirators to rape Ukraine, steal its resources, uh, abuse its population, are now pointing fingers at each other. So any money sent over there will end up inevitably in foreign bank accounts to subsidize Zelensky and his crew. Uh, you've got uh, battalion, brigade, uh, battalion, brigade, corps commanders who are stuffing their pockets full of cash that should go to widows and orphans, but they don't report all the dead uh, so they can pocket other people's salaries. Uh, it's, I, yeah, I could go on and on. Uh, right now, the drug cartels are walking around with javelin missiles that they acquired in the arms bazaars that have been thriving now for the last three years because of the uh, Ukrainian corruption. And, you know, Kosovo, that gleaming uh, jewel of uh, democracy and liberalism, is now one of the best uh, arms bazaars in Europe for the standpoint of arming terrorists and druggers and every other conceivable form of criminal. I mean, the point is, this war is over. I mean, it was lost a long time ago. There was never any chance for Ukraine to win anything. And everybody involved in this in Washington and Kiev uh, and London and Paris and Berlin, they all have blood on their hands. They've literally murdered Ukraine. Uh, the Russians, uh, you know, have advanced very slowly and deliberately because Putin has never been interested in killing large numbers of Orthodox Christian Slavs. He regards the Ukrainians as essentially a, a, a brother nation. He's never wanted this. He's done what he's done because he was goaded into doing it by us. We pushed him very hard. We broke all of our promises and agreements with him. And we were about to put, you know, U.S. missiles with uh, NATO support into eastern Ukraine, where it could threaten Russia, its nuclear deterrent, its major cities. He wasn't going to stand for that. So at this point, it's over. Another dime should not be set in that direction. And what should happen, obviously, is we should have some sort of uh, tribunals or courts or something to try all the people that are responsible for this. But I'm sure that won't happen uh, because they're still in charge in Washington of both parties. So, so can I ask Colonel McGregor, um, what's your assessment that, that, you know, what you just said, all of the the, the casualties, the um, the destroying of, of Ukraine? I don't know that that's really a secret. It's not really talked about a whole lot in the media, but. Surely, if you're here talking about it with us, that the people in power in Washington uh, and in the other NATO countries, they know about it, I assume. Um, can you, I don't know, talk about maybe what their motivation might be then to why they would do this? Or well, why they would keep it up? You know, we could, we could spend time on looking at the people that constitute this ruling political class in Washington as well as overseas. Uh, that would lead us into interesting territory. You might want to reserve a show for that in the future. But to, but to put it bluntly, uh, their solution to the current problem is to lie. 
and they are supported in their line by the mainstream media, which is part of this ruling class, which incidentally also controls finance and your financial markets. And frankly, most of academia, although academia is controlled indirectly, you've just got lots of people that have infiltrated American academia over the last five or six decades who are, I think the word they use frequently is uh, cultural Marxists. Uh, use whatever word you want. Globalists, neocons, it's all the same. They're all the same people. And there's not a great deal that we can do about it at this point other than to fight back against the lies. And that means that you've got to go to alternative media to find out the truth. Because I got to tell you, Brad, I don't think you're right. I think there are a lot of people inside the country that really don't know the truth at all. And keep in mind that most people in the United States were never interested in Ukraine to begin with. Why would they be? Yeah. Uh, Eastern Ukraine is not on you know, the radar. It's not a, an area of vital strategic interest to the United States. As I said, when this began, we have, as Americans, 99% of the time, only very specific interests. One is prosperity and stability. Prosperity and stability. If you have prosperity and disability, then we can do business with everyone. Okay? We want peace, prosperity, and stability here in the United States, and we want it overseas. We don't have it in either place right now, which is absolutely devastating for our economic interests and our financial health, as we know. Colonel, I'm curious what you think NATO looks like on the other side of this, this conflict. I know recently President Macron called for NATO to send troops and, and that was rejected. And so I kind of want to get your take on that and then how, how you see NATO looking on the other side of this. Well, if we take a snapshot of NATO today, we, we can say that the so-called armies of NATO, with the exception of the Turkish force, are essentially boutique forces designed to intervene against people that can't fight back. Well, where are the people that, that can't fight back? Well, they're in the Middle East, they're in Africa, uh, they're probably in much of Latin America, certainly much of uh, Southeast Asia and beyond. Uh, we've just about run out of people that can't fight back to bomb, bully, sanction, and uh, attack. So I suspect you know, the next step is to fight somebody who can fight back. But I don't think that's going to happen for the reason that you just pointed out. The, the political leaders have dismantled their military capability. We've dismantled much of our own. The United States Army can't even recruit. They just cut 24,000 spaces out of the force. There are only 450,000 people. That's a, a force smaller than the numbers of Ukrainians killed fighting the Russians. Wow. Wake up. Who are we kidding? You know, the Marine Corps has just, I guess, turned itself into a highly skilled police force because it doesn't have the wherewithal to fight anybody who can fight back. Now, historically, that's not new for the Marines. We generally use them in places like Nicaragua or Honduras or uh, any number of places where people can't fight back. Uh, but for the army, this is catastrophic. You don't have an army anymore. And an army has two missions. It has to defend the government and the American people at home. It's the last argument of the state. When all else fails, you send in the regular army because our historic experience with the National Guard is the National Guard is a little squeamish about suppressing its own people. So you send in the regular army to do that. Well, what regular army have you got right now? I don't think you've got much. And if you add all the social engineering crap, which is just crap, and you the destruction of any meritocracy, well, what have you got? You've got nothing. Now, the Air Force and the Navy have similar problems. In some cases, I think the Navy is even worse off. I, I hear from people all the time, you know, people that only have three or four years left to retirement in the Navy who are experienced aviators who are leaving. It's so objectionable. The service is so offensive to them that they just want to leave. They don't want to stay anymore. So we're in ruins. We're not going to challenge anybody right now who can really fight back. And that includes Russia. So we're looking at Ukraine ending up uh, much like Vietnam. What did we do at the end of Vietnam? We left. What do you do when you make a big mistake? You stop talking about it. Yeah. I remember when we left Vietnam and who talked about it? For years, no one said a word. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the media will run completely silent on it. The media is really not saying much about what's happening in Israel. 
mean, you get a little bit here and there, but you've got to go to alternative media to find out the truth. And again, you know, that's that's something about which, honestly, most Americans aren't interested. What are Americans interested in? They're interested in what happens here. They're yeah. upset over the open borders of, of 10, 11, 12 million people pouring into the country from God knows where, about whom we know nothing, and we can't afford we're, we're on the downslide, in case you, you gentlemen have not noticed it. Our economy is not booming, contrary to popular belief. We don't have a vast manufacturing base. You know, at the end of the Depression, you know, people said, well, look how quickly we recovered. Once we got into that war, well, you had a couple of things going for you. First of all, you had a huge skilled labor force. All I had to do was go to work. You had an enormous manufacturing base. All you had to do was set the machines on fire and get to work. What have we got? And we're adding tens of millions of people from outside the country. What is, where does that leave Americans? You know, Americans need jobs. Americans need to put food on the table. And what do we hear? Well, Americans, you know, they're lazy and fat. They won't work the hell with them. Let's bring in all these other foreigners. What? Now, listen, I know there's a lot of obesity, but I know a lot of Americans and they want to work. And a lot of them can't find work. So it's nonsense. But, you know, this is the sort of crap that you get inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. And I would tell you that the, the ruling political class there is no different from the ruling political class in London and Paris and Berlin. They don't care about us. Mm -hmm. They're not interested. They're worried about their donors. Right now. Washington is donor-occupied territory. So they're going to feed you and everybody else nonsense. You're supposed to believe it. You know, somebody said, what are we doing about the border? Well, we're doing everything we can. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the border really is secure. Come on, give me a break. I, I give, I, you know, these people are geniuses when it comes to fiction and lying. Uh, but there's nothing happening that's in our interest. So that's the problem is it doesn't matter what happens overseas to most Americans. And by the way, everything overseas shrinks to insignificance next to what happens here at home. Yeah. That's the truth. So, you know, you're, yeah. you're close to it. You live near it. You see what's happening. Uh, I mean, I was with a group of Americans recently who were talking to me about specifically just for the audience's uh, consumption, black Americans. And they said, we lose all the jobs to these people. I yeah. said, well, what, how, what are you doing? Well, what can we do? And, you know, that's not an unreasonable question. Because right now I get questions all the time about the coming election. They say, well, you know, what we have to do is get Donald Trump back in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then what? Right. Listen, I, I like him a lot and I s supported him. But what did he do when he got in there? He worried about Obamacare. Remember all the rallies in 2016? What did you hear? Build the wall. Build the wall. And every time you mentioned Clinton, everybody said, Lock her up. Lock her up. Mm -hmm. so what were the first two things that he needed to do when he took over? First, go, go to work on the border. Fire everybody in every key position, especially Comey and his friends, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Appoint a special counsel and go after the Clinton crime empire. But he didn't. He worried about Obamacare. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I, I ask people all the time, what do you think is going to happen in November? And what do you do about the Congress? We couldn't even impeach Mayorkas. I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible. Look at the man. Look at what he's done. Right. He's helping to destroy us. He wants to replace us. You know, what, what's the problem with Americans? Well, they expect to have a decent wage. They want a decent living. They're probably going to ask some hard questions. They're not going to be mindless sheep that will herd into the corral and do as they're told. That's what these people want. The only way we can avoid this outcome is to fight back. And we, I certainly hope for the best in November, but I wouldn't bet on much. Oh, we have varying opinions about what's going to happen in November here on the show. But that's interesting <laughs> that you brought up Trump because one of the questions I wanted to get to was, does he understand the real nature of, I don't know how to put it, the enemy within wow. the deep state and the foreign policy establishment. Does he understand what needs to be done this go around? Or it sounds like you're saying he probably still doesn't. 
Uh, I, I'm not sure. The first thing I would tell you is that people are always told, well, oh, he's a tough guy. He's a fire breather. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And how many people did he actually fire? And how long did he keep people on board long past the point in time when they should have been removed? So that's not encouraging. And the other thing is he, he still surrounds himself with a lot of people who were there before. That's not encouraging. You know, this is one of these situations where if it were legal and you had a machine gun, you could point in any direction and anything you hit in Washington would probably be in the interest of the American people. Now, I know that that seems outrageous, but you get my point. It's a metaphor for yeah. the problem. Yeah. The whole thing needs to go away. You know, and are there good people in Congress? Yeah, sure. I can probably count them because there aren't that many. <laughs> and uh, are there good people in the Senate? Yeah, sure. And I can count them because there aren't very many of them either. We are wallowing in a sea of corruption. Donors own the place. Remember old Ralph Nader? I always liked Ralph because he's an honest man, whether you agree with him or not. And Ralph used to say, well, don't worry about Washington. It's corporate owned. It's, it's occupied territory. Well, now it's donor owned. You have oligarchs, billionaires with huge quantities of money, and they contribute to other facades that are actually front organizations for their agendas. And those organizations make or break you as a politician. And if you're in a place like the House where you only have two years to serve, you spend all your time running for re-election. A lot of senators do the same thing. They go off the hill to a special place where they can make phone calls to donors. Please, I need money. You've got to help me. Well, what's the cost of all of that? The cost of that is betraying the American people. And one of the best ways to do that is to tell her, oh, China, China's the threat. China's the threat. It's getting tougher right now because China's a mess. Mm -hmm. But the problem is it's China, 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 you know, Russia, 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 uh, Islamic Jihad, Islamic Caliphate. Uh, it's always an external force that somehow or another poses a, an existential threat. Somebody said to me, we got to get those Chinese because of the fentanyl. I said, we lose 110,000 Americans every year to fentanyl poisoning. Not because China is encouraging us to imbibe fentanyl. It's because we don't control the border. We don't control right. our ports. We don't control the airports. We don't control anything. And so 110,000 Americans die from that. How many Americans are dying all over the world in the conflicts we've been involved. Well, some, but relatively few when you compare it to that. So from my standpoint, I'm worried about the 110,000 people we just lost. That's human capital. Remember, we still try to educate people. We try to send them to college. We try to train them to work and have jobs. Not as well as we should. That's another subject. We can spend hours on that too. All education mm -hmm. right now in the country with very few exceptions, should be a path to employment. We don't do it, but we could do that in the future. But nobody talks about it. Nobody really gives a damn about it. And so historically, what do we do? We shove money at things. It's like defense. Oh, we're under threat. Shove money towards it. Shove it. Money doesn't translate into capability. Doesn't mean anybody can fight. Doesn't mean you have the right people organized properly, trained properly, equipped properly and competently commanded and led. None of it. It's just you're just shoving money in that direction. And this shoving money is what's kept Ukraine going. Because we know that more than half of the sums never go overseas. They just pay for the equipment the Pentagon gives up, which has to be replenished. And in many cases, it is not the right equipment anymore. You know, this is 2023, not 1991. But hell, you look at the equipment, it hasn't changed very much. The organization hasn't changed. I mean, we could go on and on. So the, yeah. all of these things have to reach the American people. This is what you've got to, you, you guys have got to talk about and get people out of this game of, well, go out there and vote Republican or go out there and vote this way. Come on, we're past that now. We've got to enlighten people. At some point, we've got to fight back. We've got to rebel. We have to do it intelligently. We have to be organized. And we want to maintain the rule of law to the extent that we can. But that's getting very hard because we don't have the rule of law in much of the country at this point. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, you mentioned uh, about <clears throat> uh, military readiness before and with the 24,000 leaving, and I recently saw a headline, and then you also just mentioned um, the technology and the organization not, not improving as, as fast as it should. So I saw one of the headlines when they were talking about removing those 24,000 positions as this is a way to prepare the military for future the future of war and all that talk, but it doesn't seem as though that meshes with the actual organization and the technological advances that they aren't making, I guess. Well, you don't have anybody in the army right now, setting aside the whole organizational construct, which is still stuck in the Second World War, setting that out, I've written books on that and got absolutely nowhere because nobody cared, frankly. So the generals are sort of uh, fugitives from accountability because nobody cares. Uh, the problem is that the army that you have right now can't go anywhere and do very much because armies need support structures. So, oh, well, we'll pay some contractors to feed people. That's what's happening in Eastern Europe and Poland right now. Contractors are moving in and supporting things. Well, good luck with that the first time the rounds go off and the artillery bursts overhead and see how well those contractors perform. It's all nonsense. Mm. Same thing is true in the Navy. The fleet has to come into port to reload. The fleet, you know, for ammunition. The fleet has to be replenished. It doesn't sit out there for very long before it needs food. It needs ammunition, it needs water, it needs repair parts. And so we set these things up. Right now we have thousands of people in Israel preparing food and shipping it offshore to the naval forces in the Mediterranean. What do you do when you don't have that capability? What do you do when you lose that, that foot ashore? We, we're not thinking about anything. In fact, if I look at the distribution of forces all over the region, the Middle East and Eastern Europe right now, it strikes me that these are all little versions of Pearl Harbor. Hmm. Most Americans don't understand that in 1941, when the fleet completed its annual Pacific exercises, it prepared, it came into Pearl Harbor. And then historically what it did is it moved back to San Diego, Puget Sound, Portland, San Francisco. And FDR said, Oh no, 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 no. Keep the fleet at Pearl Harbor. Well, the admirals almost came unglued. They still had men of character then in the senior ranks of the Navy. And the admiral said, we can't do this. And the CNO told President Roosevelt, if we do this, we're sitting targets. We're ducks, sitting ducks in the event that the Japanese decide to attack us. And he said, it will be a deterrent to the Japanese. They would never attack the fleet while it's there. Well, Marshall, who was the chief of staff of the Army, immediately convened a meeting with the chief of naval operations and said, we have to get ready for war. FDR just embargoed Japan. They're not getting any oil, tin, coal, none of the resources that they need to sustain themselves. So how long before we're at war with Japan? And now we're sitting here with a fleet that's going to could conceivably be sunk in harbor, and we still have thousands of troops in the Philippines, and we want to use the Navy to relieve the Philippines. Well, we all know how that turned out. 12,000 American soldiers went into captivity. So what was Roosevelt up to? I think he was up to a war. And we got a war. Everybody thinks, well, that was just great. Well, wars aren't very great. And we ended up at the end of that war in the middle of a lot of things that we didn't want to be part of. But the fact was, communism won the war. And so we had to stay in Germany. We had to stay in Korea. We had to stay all over the world to halt communism. Well, that went away. But all those places did not, and all the forces to, to provide this age-old notion of deterrence remain. The problem is today you have precision-guided munitions and missiles. Anything that sits forward as a target is going to go away. The biggest mistake you can make is to push everything forward so that it's a nice target array for your enemy. It's not a good way to do business. Is anybody talking like that? No, I don't hear anybody mentioning anything that makes sense on the military no. side. No, in, in fact, this is, you know, in, after, in the wake of the Gaza-Israel situation, we have had troops get attacked by the Houthis in particular because they're sitting ducks. They, they're out there. They don't need to be. So if you're if you're sec, secretary of defense, what what is the first besides firing a bunch of people? What is the first course? What is the first course of action for the, the military? Is it bring bring those people home or what is it? Well, first, you, you really do need to reduce the senior ranks. Right now, I think we have 43 or 44 four stars for a force of a little over 1.1 million. 
And at the height of the Second World War in 1943, when we had 12.2 million men under arms, we had only seven four stars. Wow. Gosh, how could we have gotten anything right during World War II with only seven four stars? <laughs> Today, we're blessed with 43. They're such a boon to the nation. Look, uh, you've got to go after the overhead and you've got to change our so-called national military strategy because it's focused on everything other than the United States. Yeah. We have to defend the Western hemisphere, our hemisphere, where we live. So you've got to get the troops back, especially on the ground and put them on our borders. It's not just Mexico right now. The, ne the Canadian border is wide open. All sorts of drugs and, and criminals come in back and forth over and over and over again from the Great Lakes all the way to the Pacific Coast. So we have a huge problem. Then, then we have the, the criminality in our cities, our police. What are we going to do for the police? Everybody I know who's an experienced policeman wants to leave. He's afraid to enforce the law for fear he's going to go to jail. Uh, so, you know, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to cut the overhead. And you do that very simply, you know. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for your interest in national defense. You're retired, effective, blum, you're gone. And uh, meanwhile, your deputy will take over until further notice. And then you come out with a new structure. You need to chop away a lot of these commands. You need to reorganize the services. Those things have to happen. And th that legislation has to be developed quickly and passed within the first few months of the administration. Then you're going to begin saving money. But the problem is Congress won't do it because there's too much money in this amorphous mass of bureaucratic confusion. The more four stars, the more services, the more headquarters, the more interests, the more money. And so if you go in there and you want to change these things, that's a huge threat to the incomes of everybody inside the Beltway and many of our defense industries and, and so forth. Now, <coughs> the average soldier sergeant, lieutenant, captain, uh, it's going to be very happy <laughs> because uh, then the focus is back where it belongs on those people organized in formations that can deploy and fight or on the people that actually man ships and do something. But we're a long way from that. So that has to happen. And, and that means a dramatic re retirement uh, of, of the problems. And then also a retreat or retrenchment is what is really the right word, a retrenchment that brings most of these forces overseas back to the United States. We know which bases are really important. I mean, you know, if you went into the right room in the Pentagon and said, okay, there's, say there are 3,000 satellites up there, which ones are important? We know, okay? <laughs> Let's not fit ourselves. We know which, which are important and which are not. We don't need to abandon what's actually a vital strategic interest to us in terms of collecting information, intelligence, reconnaissance, and so forth. But right now, no one is doing anything, and no one will do anything. I know we only have you for a couple more minutes, but I do want to get your take on on kind of just the, the path forward and, and where you see the conflict in Israel and Gaza going. I know that there's been talks of a ceasefire, and I don't know where they are now. I haven't seen the latest headlines, but kind of want to get your, your general overview of that. Well, uh, let's look at it from the Israeli perspective. You heard Mr. Netanyahu, and he has 80 to 85 percent of the Israeli population, 100 percent behind him. And he said, uh, these people, these Arabs that live in Gaza and presumably, you know, in the West Bank and potentially elsewhere, they're animals. They deserve to be killed. Effectively. That's what he said. So. That's number one. Number two, don't worry. We can do whatever we want because we control the American government. I have said it repeatedly. Mr. Netanyahu has far more influence over policymakers in Washington than Joe Biden. Hmm. He does. And he's got plenty of support there to keep it that way. Why do you think that is? Well, why do you think it is? Don't ask me to give you the obvious answer. <clears throat> You're an intelligent man. Why is that? Well, I mean, I, I I would say something to do with maybe the AI AIPAC and donors and you know the the media controlled apparatus of you know anytime someone goes against Israel they get called names right and so there's fear of of being uh, labeled something that perhaps you're not right I think that maybe those two things play a part. 
Have you thought of running for office? You are very, very good. And you're very, very eloquent in avoiding all the ugliness that has to be known before anybody pays attention. <laughs> you, you are you are absolutely right, Brad. You've hit all the, the critical buttons, and then you have to lump in with the people that you're talking about, the organizations, the institutions, all the what we call advocacy tanks. They call them think tanks. They, nobody does any thinking. They're all advocacy organizations or advocacy tanks. And understand that you've already given the executive branch a lobotomy anyway, so they're not going to get in the way. So who is who's then ultimately calling the tune? Well, it's back to the donors. You, you've explained one group. You've got other donors. You've got donors from the defense industries that have deep interests and deep ties that are making enormous quantities of money. And then you have various other groups, groups that you, may surprise you. You know, when you start to look at these uh, nonprofits or uh, non-governmental organizations that are from Panama all the way up to the Mexican border, you find things like Catholic charities, uh, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid uh, Society, uh, where Mr. Mayorkas, incidentally, was on the board. Yeah. And these NGOs are getting huge quantities of money. I mean, somebody said to me the other day, well, you know, we just can't get through to help anybody in Gaza. Well, we seem to get through to help everybody in Central America that's landing down in Darien that wants to march north. So why can the NGOs be successful in one area and the NGOs are not successful in another? Okay, five seconds are up, you know the answer. Uh, the, the bottom line is that the whole structure of power in this country is a mess because it exists for many reasons, none of which have anything to do with your interests, my interests, and the interests of other citizens in the United States. Now, this can't go on forever. Uh, it never does, but eventually, eventually it will change. I would prefer to see it change peacefully. Yeah, but I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that. I, I, you know, I want it that way. I really do, and I don't want any kind of armed conflict. I, I give presentations all the time, and I tell people there's a monument up at West Point, at Trophy Point, and it's a monument to the dead from the Civil War. This thing is huge. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. It's, it's the largest uh, pure granite column, polished column in the Western Hemisphere. Wow. And it is a monument just to the members of the regular army who were killed in the war. Of course, the bad joke for many years from Southerners was, yeah, it's a monument to Southern marksmanship. Uh, not nice and not a good thing to say. But the point is, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to see that happen in our country. That was a disaster for us. It took us decades to recover from the Civil War. People mm -hmm. don't know that. Yeah. So we don't want to go through that again. So I want, through legal means, to, to alter the structure of power. Uh, so I hope for the best in November. And by the way, I've, I've talked about Donald Trump. I also know JFK uh, or RFK Jr. I think he's a very fine man, and I think he's a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody said, well, can't you get them together? I can do a lot of things, but I can't put RFK Jr. and Donald Trump together on the same ticket, though I think that would be a good thing for the American people. But even then, you've got to go after this Congress. And I always tell people, if you haven't read it, get on the Internet, Google the name Oliver Cromwell, and then read the speech he gave to the Parliament when he finally dissolved it and shut it down. That speech pretty much sums up the state of affairs in Washington right now. Wow. Well, I think we have a Thomas Sowell agrees with me. Yeah. We wild. were going back and forth the other day, and he said, absolutely. And he liked the phrase at the end where Cromwell said, In the uh, you know, in the name of God, for all the good that you have done, go, go, go. In other words, get out. Mm -hmm. And ultimately they did. And, and I, I just don't know what you do because you, I can point to somebody like Chip Roy, who's a super person, or Andy Biggs, he's a good human being. There, there are lots of good people there, but the problem is there aren't enough of them. Yeah, They don't constitute a uh, critical mass, and they're not well-led because uh, you got to say no. I mean, I was happy that Johnson stood his ground on this legislation, but I, I wonder how long that's going to last. And Not we got to stop being so hypocritical. 
we need to stop it all overseas and get out yeah. and get back here. Yeah. So you're saying John Cornyn taking over as Senate minority <laughs> leader is not going to save us. <laughs> no, no. I, I think look at his donors and that'll oh, answer I'm, all of your questions. Yeah. So we only have a few more minutes with you. Can you I thought we just had a few more minutes a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, well we're we're trying to we're trying to stretch this out as long as possible. You know? A couple more minutes. So can you tell you you came on as CEO of Our Country, Our Choice. Can you tell us a little bit about that organization? And we can run the video if you want us to do that as well, because we have it uploaded. Okay. Well, Our Country, Our Choice, you can find it at our country, our choice, one word, dot com. But bear in mind, for the last several weeks, we have been under vicious attack by various uh, cyber uh, enemies, uh, mm -hmm. stretching from Germany to Portland, Oregon. And that's why we know we're doing a great job. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that we're up to a quarter of a million members now. Now, what are we about? We were founded because a number of people decided they wanted skin in the game. People said, let's put our money into this. And they founded this organization. They said, we want to unite Americans across party lines. We are tired of the divisions. The divisions are a distraction. You know, you try. it's not just war overseas. It's war here between people. Those are distractions. We have to get past those. So we want to unify the movement. We want to focus on the things that unite us. In other words, stop talking about those divisive things that obviously set people a blaze against each other. And what are those things that unite us? Well, we think these interventions overseas should end. Yeah. We think that we have to rationalize defense spending. That means we're going to have to make some cuts and changes. We think the borders should be defended by the United States Armed Forces. We think the Coast Guard, which is sailing around in the South China Sea, should be here, stopping people coming into our ports. We, we think that the United States Air Force should be primarily focused on us and defending our skies. In other words, let's get back to what's important here at home. And then let's stop the sexualization of our children, because part of closing that border is to stop the trafficking of children, mm -hmm. which is out of control. I'm sure you've seen the movie Sound of Freedom. If you haven't, you need to go see it. It's outrageous. Mm -hmm. This affects all of us. And the sickness in this country that breeds that. I mean, the, the pe pedophilia industry is frightening. This yeah. needs to be crushed. So I think we need Singapore-like sanctions inside the United States. And, you know, there's a man named Lee Kuan Yew. I encourage you to read his book. It's all about nation building and how he built Singapore. We, we need a similar process here now. So that's it. And then the other thing that we really want to do is we want to recruit people from outside the Beltway in our country, our choice that we can bring to Washington. Mm. I mean, we we want to we want we like rallies and we like waving the flag. That's not enough. We've got to replace the people there. And I say, if they come from the Ivy Leagues, if they're coming out of the service academies, mm -hmm. to poison. Don't go back to the poison well and drink again. That's what Donald Trump did after he took over in 2017. I'm going to get the best people. He went to the poison well and brought all the poison people back to work. We don't need to do that. There are plenty of good human beings, sound American citizens, intelligent and capable, that live beyond the Beltway all over the country. You know, I would rather have a truck driver from Cincinnati uh, move into the Washington bureaucracy anywhere you want to put him than any of the people that are there now because I know he's honest. I know he's an American. He's going to act in defense of the country. He's going to work hard to make things right. You know, this is what Andrew Jackson did that, that people attacked him at the time for. And then later on, he became a hero. He just said, we're going to clean sweep. We're going to start over. People say, well, it's too dangerous to do that. No, it's not. It's too dangerous not to do it. And by the way, all of this, all of this has to be based on merit. You've got to get out of this business of, well, he gets ahead or she gets ahead because she's in some sort of new category of human being. They keep trying to divide us into new categories. I don't even want to talk about it and go there. That all needs to go away. It's all about merit. You can do the job. You're competent. We want you. If you're not competent, if you're corrupt and you can't do the job, we don't want you. We don't care who you are. We've got to do that. 
Awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so well, much. We appreciate it. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, I was just going to say, thank you for your time. We really appreciate you taking the time to come talk to us. And we'll, we'll reach out again for that hour long show on those other topics. <laughs> All right. Well, Brad, keep it up. I think you have a political future. Well, thank you, sir. I'll, I'll, I'll consider that. <laughs> All right. Thanks guys. Good luck. Thanks thank for your you. time. Getting drafted. What am I going to run for? Little does Nothing, he know hopefully. he has thought about running for office. <laughs> Hold on a second. Colonel McGregor, Colonel McGregor, CEO of, uh, what is it? Our, our, country, our, cho our country, your choice, just said that I should run for office, right? Being generous. And, you have, and then you have the gall, <laughs> the gumption to come at me and say, hopefully nothing. <laughs> He's <laughs> jealous. Peanut butter and jealous. Peanut butter and jealous. <laughs> Well, that was great. I learned a ton um, during that. I thought that was uh, he, great. Yeah, he uh, he typically brings the heat. I would say he brought it up a notch for our <laughs> interview right there, because uh, I've listened to a lot of his stuff and I've been following him since the beginning of the Russia Ukraine war. And he doesn't hold punches, but he came out real hot today. Maybe he's got some fun meetings in D.C. after this. Yeah. yeah, that was really cool. I, I, Michael, thank you for uh, bringing him onto the show. We'll give you credit for that one. Um, yeah. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, what else shall we do? Wrap us up? No. Oh, we, yeah. What wrap us up for what? What, which, oh, what else we got to talk about? Well, first, let's stop here and just say, okay, everybody, go to our country, our choice, sign up, become a member or whatever of his organization. You can, you can, uh, he has his own website. It's called douglasmcgregor.com. You can also follow him on the Twitter at Douglas A or Doug A. McGregor. Uh, he puts out lots of good content. He's always also on Judge Knapp's show, a bunch of shows on YouTube. So go check him out if you want. Yeah, we'll put all the links down. We'll put all the links for that yeah. down in the description. You don't need to memorize all that stuff. Um. Man, I mean, there's that was that there was a lot there. I wish that we had more time with him. Hopefully, he'll come back on and talk for talk to us a, a lot more about, I don't know, some some more solutions, right? Maybe he'll maybe maybe he'll guide me a little bit. He'll mentor me into which position he'll run for. I don't know. Maybe. 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 Uh, hey, I can I can think of some swamp creatures that you're in their district. I'm not calling anybody yeah. out specifically, Mister Williams, mm. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well you guys want to talk you guys want to talk real quick about uh governor abbott possibly being trump's vp or do you guys want to end the show here we can talk about that let's talk about it let's talk about abbott possibly being trump's vp i mean i was i you know it, it's it's refreshing to hear someone of colonel mcgregor's status and knowledge you know push back against the narrative that trump is going to be the end all be all fix everything candidate He's going to win and, you know, all of a sudden it's going to be rainbows and, and shooting stars. Um, and, you know, point to the fact that not a whole lot. I mean, you know, there was some good stuff for sure in his first um, presidency. But a lot left to be desired, right? Is if, yeah. he choose, if you were to choose governor, I mean, what is the, does Trump go for a VP that will, you know, keep him honest, keep him, you know, in that direction? Someone like maybe a Vivek might do that. Maybe. I don't know. Is Or is Greg Abbott, is Greg Abbott going to be that person? Great. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, I, I thought it was, I really wanted to ask Colonel McGregor about Trump, what he really thought. And he just kind of did it for us. We didn't even really have to ask him. So I was interested yeah. to hear that. I bet if you pressed him, he'd on choose one, Trump or RFK. He's probably more on RFK, in RFK's camp now. Um, in terms of who Trump will pick for VP, I'm I'm law. I don't know who he's going to pick. I I worry he's going to pick somebody pretty milk toast, and that we're not, I'm not going to be excited about. So like Christy Nome, probably Elise Stefanik. Who Tim Scott, Elise Stefanik, at least the, the Congresswoman or whatever Stefanik. Yes, from he's New not going to pick someone who's going to overshadow him. Sure, they don't. He doesn't he's want to pick someone who is just like Mike Pence. Like that is exactly he's gonna he's gonna pick a younger version of Mike Pence. Most you mean a, you mean a hardcore patriot? <laughs> yeah. So Greg Abbott. 
Okay. Um, I mean, I think Abbott's very when he wants to be like fiery and outspoken, I think he is. I don't see that from some of these other ones. So I, I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. But Greg Abbott's Greg Abbott will certainly I mean, he'll get Texas anyway. So the advantage, you know, presumably an advantage to Greg Abbott would be to to any presidential candidate was that he would bring Texas, but Trump's gonna win Texas no matter what. So right. is there a, a strategic advantage there? Would someone like Tim Scott not that what's Tim Scott's home? South Carolina? South Carolina. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Trump's going to win South Carolina or not. Probably, right? Michael? Charles? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. But he's a black man. So maybe that pulls some independence or some of the African-American vote, right? I mean, maybe. It's a possibility if, if black people are going to vote for somebody just because he picked a black person. Sure. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm not, kidding. Not, I'm <laughs> kidding. I know it's conventional. I, yeah, I know. I'm giving you a hard time. Um Yes, that's a possibility, but I think also there are other black people who are would probably be better suited for the position, like a Wesley Hunt. Um, I think would be more of, uh, on Trump's like in Trump's vein of who he would want to have as his vice president, more so than a Tim Scott. I mean, I I, I think they're probably both on the list, but um, and same thing. Even there's a guy I can't think of his name from Michigan. Michigan's a critical state, so maybe him. I think it's Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. Um, and, and, uh, I think his name is John James. And so you just, yeah, you just never know. We'll just know. I, I don't know. Can't trust a guy with a name no. like John James. He, he could go with a Ben Carson too. I'm kind of rooting right out there. I'm kind of rooting for Tulsi Gabbard. And then my picks that aren't going to happen that I want are RFK, RFK and, uh, Tucker. Oh, well, Oh, Maybe their own. Well, I mean, I guess our, I mean, I don't know what our RFK. I, mean, do. I don't know. I mean, listen, none of them are going to do anything anyway, even if like no, no matter who he picks is going to. Why do like, you say that? What what vice president stands out and other than like Mike Pence not overturning the election? What vice prince vice vice president? Vice has, prince. <laughs> do you like? I mean, do you even remember Biden from the Obama years? Like, I vaguely. I just feel like either way, would it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Other well, than I mean, put them on a pedestal to potentially work for office later. Well, I mean, people will remember Kamala Harris. Well, she's the first woman. Yeah, and I think they, they probably will. But they also remember her for her incompetency. I don't know. Will they remember her for that? I mean, I hopefully. Will. Yeah, Michael will, right? I mean, well, I'm talking about like the 99% of people in the United States who don't pay attention to this stuff. Right Michael, now. you're in the top 1%. It's true. I pay way too much go. attention to this stuff. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what he decides to do. It'll be interesting. I think he's going to disappoint. I guess we will see. You think he'll disappoint? Yeah, I think he will. Are you, well, Michael, <clears throat> I mean, I would be di uh, disappointed in myself if I, if I didn't bring it up. But how about that Bitcoin? Am I right? Wish How you on some, right? Bitcoin? Huh? What? No, I don't wish that. You, why? I mean, I guess I, I. It would be yeah. Okay, I'll I'll say this. I if I had if I. It's not that I don't own any any cryptocurrency. Calm down. All right, I'm not a luddite. One, two. He owns Dogecoin. That would also be pretty great right now. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, but if you, yeah, I mean, if I had bought it, I don't know several years ago or even last year, whatever, and it increased to the current price and then I sold it, I would be happy. But if I just hung on to it forever, I don't think that that's, I personally don't think it's a wise choice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I am one of those people that... On that your bought. shirt, you turn it doesn't do anything. <laughs> I like to buy Bitcoin when it's really low, so we'll just say that. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so you have uh, it's what it's at sixty something thousand right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good luck. I guess. Yeah, it might go back down. At which point, I'll buy more. And it'll be when do you sell it? By what number? Just out of curiosity, what's your not? You don't have to give. You're not giving financial advice, but you have. Let's say you have one Bitcoin, right? And what at what number do you wait to sell it at? The whole thing? 
to sell the oh, whole I'll yeah the never, whole I'll probably, never, I'll probably never sell the whole thing okay i will add you to get, it you're gonna add okay so you so this is a so you're never gonna you're never gonna use it no i'm no that's not fair i take profits sometimes but i i don't know 100 and 100 at 100 maybe and it's when you sell one bitcoin take that hundo no i wouldn't sell the whole thing go buy a sell whatever my, i would sell whatever my original investment is so that i get my money back and then it's just all profit and then i would wait for it to come back down which it will yeah i'll buy more yeah and then i'll do the same thing okay and then just keep accumulating sats yeah get them sats boy <laughs> Get them sat, stack them. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, what's what? Okay, is that it? Are we done? Yeah. Yeah. Let's. We're gonna call it quick. Yeah, thank you for joining this show. I don't, I don't, yeah. <laughs> talk about. Th thank you for joining the show. Uh, you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Swale, it's Charles Blaine at CJ Blaine Ten. Me at MCRL ATX. Share this mom with your show. Do it now or share this show with your mom. Share, <laughs> share your mom with your yeah, show. Mom. <laughs> Yo, bro, what's up? Share the show with your mothers and crazy uncles and uh, like and subscribe. Do all the things. Thanks for hello really to, and show. hello to our favorite mom, Miss Blaine. Hello. So, all right. Thanks, guys.